Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is a bear's inheritance, the rapid evolution of polar bears. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Christina Disney. Christina, thank you so much for being here today and for bringing us, I know, one of your favorite topics, bears. Let's go ahead and dive in. Thank you so much, Sunny, and thank you everyone else for also tuning in today. And Sunny is right. This is one of my favorite things to deep dive into, not only as a polar bear guide, um, but just because like so many of us around the world, you kind of just can't help but loving bears. And what I love about these webinars is that I get to go down rabbit holes um, and bring some people along with them and dig into some curiosity. And so today's curiosity comes from something I've been saying for years, uh, and I fully admit, I don't think I really stopped to understand what it meant. So we talk about bears being, polar bears specifically, being an example of rapid evolution. And that, in some ways, the way that I've been brought up to think as a biologist or trained as a biologist is an oxymoron in the sense that evolution is not rapid. So what in the world is rapid evolution? And so that is going to be the topic of our webinar today. I'll kind of walk us through some evolutionary bits and then I'll dig into what that means for bears. Before I do, I want to take one moment, uh, maybe somewhat selfishly, to say hello to Paul and Dory. I did get your message, and they said they'd be tuning in today, so I just wanted to say hello um, to bring everyone along with you. Paul and Dory were some of the kindest, most warm-hearted guests I've had. They were on my last trip in Churchill, just at the end of 2023 here. Um, and so I appreciate the follow-up. I hope you're also doing well, to all of you and your loved ones. And thanks for tuning in today, both of you and to everyone else. So thank you for my quick aside and let's roll into some very fun science. So when we think about evolution, and this is the part I'd never really thought of, or I'd never taken the time to think, or never taken the time to break it apart, but this notion of what is the pace of evolution? Um, there's also different theories around it. And so I think for most of us, when we think about evolution, we think about these slower trajectories. Um, we're taught to think that it happens on these scales that are beyond our human, uh, human lifespan and human time span, which is true um, in a lot of ways, um, but it's much more nuanced than that. And it's also very multifaceted and it goes in many different pathways and directions. And so again, as a biologist, we kind of go back to one of our key anchors, the uh, gentleman in the bowler cap there is Darwin, right? So if we roll our clock back to the 1800s, is that the theory then, this idea that species are competing, species are evolving and changing, right? But it takes millions and millions of years and you would never, you never see it happening. Um, and so it's interesting because both of that is a notion in science, but it's also kind of almost this pop culture notion. Think about the Big Bang Theory or things like that. Um, we're taught that this, this theory exists, but that it exists outside of a way that we can understand it. Um, you know, we can't think about our grandparents, grandparents, grandparents. It's hard for us to even perceive that a few generations back, forget about thousands of generations. But we do our best. We do our best to understand the world in, in bite-sized pieces. And when it comes to evolution, we do that through collecting different forms of evidence. And that might come from biology, that might come from chemistry, paleontology, right? Um, things like coevolution uh, and morphology, right? So this is one thing that never stops being fascinating to me is even though all of these animals exist across the world and live in fantastically different ways, we can break down and see their general anatomy and how those bones have just changed, right? It's the same set of bones. It's the same, I guess, pun intended skeleton structure, right? That they're working from, but depending on which ones you emphasize, which ones actually become residual or become de-evolved, right? Decide the function and the form that they're gonna fit into into their environment. So 
I would say the most classical way to think about evolution is simplified into this, is that whatever this imaginary animal is, our little pentagon star squiggly thing that's evolving, a long time ago, right, it's very basic, and, or this one's starting off very basic, and as time goes by, it evolves slowly and slowly and slowly and becomes very different. And then if we want to capture that through paleontology, we see these different layers, right? That's how we give ourselves our timeline. We have these different geological layers that we can link up to climatic events or changes in the earth. And so that's how we can keep track of, okay, well, it was this way for this long, and then it was this way. But it's this notion that it took millions and millions of years to make that transition. Now, paleontology is kind of like doing a murder mystery without all the pe or a puzzle without all the pieces, right? Because um, sometimes we come across sections where we see one species and then it looks like it just did this crazy big jump in the very next layer and it became a totally different species very, very quickly, much faster than that kind of slow motion, gradual change we've come to anticipate. Now, in one way, this can be explained geologically. And by that, I mean, this can happen when you can imagine that you have one layer of rock that lays down, your fossils get made, but then the next layer, for some reason or another, maybe it's not made of as robust material, maybe some glaciers came and scratched it all away so that the next layer got squished down right on top of it. And so we actually lose all of that pink layer in between. So that when we see the brown and the yellow layer, even though by rock layers, they're right next to each other, the reality is that we were missing millions of years. And so this is the counter argument that lots of people used to have that rapid evolution didn't exist. That, oh, if we saw these really big changes, it's just because we're missing records. Well, sometimes that's true, right? Um, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes there are these examples of different organisms throughout history, across the world, different, everywhere from insects all the way up to bears, like we're going to show you, where they just change extremely quickly. And now that we've accepted in our big scientific world that that's possible, we are starting to sort of scratch our heads as to why. Why is it that some species kind of just trudge along and slowly change? And why is it some of them just poof, skyrocket and become uh, in some ways uh, almost indistinguishable or unidentifiable from their, from their predecessors? So, one thing I want to make a big distinction on here before we keep going with this is that there's a difference between the evolution of traits and there's the evolution of survival. Those are, this is only one way to kind of split up the understanding and that's the words I'm going to use today. It might be explained differently in other ways, but these are just to kind of understand two different concepts. And this is what I mean by this. When I say evolution of traits, I'm talking about more so genetic plasticity. So big fancy words, but what that's saying is that um, an organism might look different. We say that's their phenotype. So this is a really fun example here. This is looking at, I think it's moths. And it's this idea that depending on whether the moth larvae are developing, or species, where if they develop in a warmer climate versus a cooler one for that season, it will decide what their life state cycle is like for that annual year. So if it's a wet one, they actually get these big cool patterns. They live really, uh, kind of live fast, die young, where they have multiple generations in the same season. But if it's cooler and there, it's a cue that it's going to be drier, then actually they only have one adult cycle for that season. They're trying very hard to stay alive because there's less um, resources available. And their wing color is way less dramatic and beautiful and it's more subtle and it's meant to hide, right? Um, rather than distract. And so this is an example of what I would say is genetic plasticity. Because next year these moth larvae will be born and they'll have the same selection of genes as the previous year did. They didn't lose or gain any genes. They're still kind of the same, but the expression of those genes, the malleability of them, right, that is the evolution of traits. So those traits can get pushed in one direction or another, but your population is still genetically the same versus you can actually push the genetics of a population such that they're not similar anymore. So one way that I have started thinking about this, um, is the idea of like a DJ sound booth switch or like an old switchboard or something like that. Uh, so this is an example of a bunch of little tiny crabs, ones you might find on the beach. They're kind of the ones that, you know, they're about the size of a quarter maybe. 
and they're the ones where once you start looking on the beach you can't stop seeing them like you don't see any because they all blend in so well but then once your eyes learn to pick them out they're just everywhere um and most of them are actually the same species even though they look dramatically different so again this is an example of different trait expressions or pheno, um, phenotypic plasticity those are the big fancy words but we won't stress about it so but the way i think about it is you have this big switchboard and those are all your genes and your environment the way you're raised even maybe these crabs emotions i know even our emotions right trauma things like that can decide which ones get switched on and off and then that decides what color you are whether you have spots whether you have stripes but you have the same switchboard now when we talk about evolution of survival that's when your switchboard changes you no longer have the same buttons or maybe you have kind of the same buttons and they could do the same things but they don't exist in the same places so i think about it as evolution is kind of like you're changing your remote control so instead of having the same board uh you've got buttons that can do new things or different things and the other thing to keep in mind or a fun analogy i think is that it's like when you get a new tv it is only one in a million chances that your old remote is going to work for your new tv right you have to get the same one that matches it so that's then the framework that's the baseline of what your genes are going to be able to do and so you can lose genes gain genes um and what decides how that happens right what's the cause of that evolution and this is where we get into a bunch of different theories and a bunch of different circumstances because it can be multiple things happening together it can be one all on its own um, so just kind of as i roll through these next ones keep in mind that they can interplay off of one another so what are the causes of rapid evolution and you could say what are, these also apply to just regular evolution but you need to have kind of this uh not test bed but you need to have change is one way we think about or is one approach to it so one notion is the idea of isolation right you have a larger population something happens in the case of our little snails here it's like a little mountain grows up between our oceans and one snail gets stuck stuck in one ocean the other one gets stuck on the other side and let's just say that if you only have two stuck on the side then their genes are going to propagate and you're going to have a very specific set of genes versus the other ones are going to continue to mix around a lot and so you're going to start getting different uh, different remote controls right now something else which sometimes can be very quick and very drastic and sometimes we would think on our human scales would be slow is environmental conditions and that's everything from climate patterns to um down to things like floods something about that but also think about things that could be drastic think about things like earthquakes and volcanoes um, there's what a volcano can do to the land right underneath of it but also think about what a volcano can change in atmosphere and it can change you know big explosions can change in atmospheres for years to decades right and that can force some changes to happen so that's kind of interacting with their environment and then also obviously there's other organisms in your environment you're always interacting with so competition is a really big driver of change of evolution um, and that can be within your own species that can be competing with other species it can be the absence of a competitor right if there's two species that have evolved together always fighting to eat that lo lovely leaf excuse me on the side and one day something happens and a disease wipes out all of the one then that other species has this opportunity to fill in this niche and just bloom and expand and go in lots of different ways um, and this is also complicated which is why biology is so much fun to study because we're trying to piece it all together right uh, another one is migration it's not necessarily that you know like the first example where we had the snails getting separated by something in their environment it could be that the animal is actually leaving or expanding and so then you have to respond to the world that you're changing to. You have to respond to different food sources. Um, maybe you become a generalist for all of them. Maybe you only stay in one area and you actually become a specialist here, vice versa, right? There's so many different ways to get through the world. And another one that more, I would say, or argue more and more people are starting to acknowledge is that actually human intervention is certainly an example of evolution. Uh, an example that I grew up learning, certainly in Canada, and I feel like um, probably those from the States or from the Eastern Seaboard, is the collapse of the cod industry. There, you know, there's stories of cod being so large and so abundant, you know, they say you could walk across their back. 
uh, coming up to St. Lawrence and things like that. Today, the population actually, even though hunting pressure has been gone for decades or fishing pressure, they haven't recovered. And there's been a lot of research into looking as to why. And a lot of evidence shows because of the genetic push. So what's happened is that these larger cod were being hunted. The smaller, the smaller cod with the different genetics that were selecting for smaller ones um, became more abundant. And it's actually, now they don't have the genetic versatility. They've actually changed the remote control on the cod where we can't reach those other buttons to grow bigger or to have those sizes. So they only have so many eggs because they're smaller and they only have this type of habitat because they're smaller. Um, and so we've, we've very quickly just gone ax a whole bunch of genes in the population. And they don't have access, we don't, the population doesn't have access to them anymore. And so now it has to recreate its diversity and it may never do that. Um, right? It's just something to, to admit. Cod may never come back, even if we never go back to fishing them in the same extent. And when I'm saying never, I mean, I'm talking on the scale of maybe thousands of years, but also it could be never that, you know, this is what it means to be, to be going extinct. And those never words are valid. It's not an exaggeration. And one other thing I want to point out, and this is a, maybe a bit more abstract than a uh, as tangible example, but one of my favorite theories in biology is called the, the Red Queen theory or the Red Queen effect. And a biologist literally took it from thinking about Alice in Wonderland. And it's the notion that you have to keep running just to stay in the same place. So I feel like the examples that I just gave you or this notion that um, something happens or either the, the individual organism invokes change or change is forced upon it and therefore something happens. But another way to kind of shift that lens is that animals are always evolving. Everything is always changing. It's actually more of a rarity to stay the same. And so if you want to just exist in this changing world, you have to always keep changing all the time. So those evolutions aren't, they're not driven um, you know, they are driven by these specific changes, but that it's an ongoing process. Uh, and maybe I'm biased because I really love Alice in Wonderland, or maybe I'm biased because I like the idea that I exist in a world that doesn't stay the same. Uh, it's kind of scarier and it's harder to understand. But my one of my favorite thoughts is that nature is not a jar of jam. You can't preserve her. You can't put it and leave it as it is. Nature is this growing enigmatic beast of its own that's always on the go and we just have to find where and when we fit in best. Um, so maybe that's one thing you'll you'll take away from today is changing your notion of how we how we fit into evolution in nature. So these are I've kind of just talked about in theory these are the causes of how rapid evolution can occur but I also want to shift our lens a bit and talk about how we study evolution because that also affects the how we learn something affects what we can know about it. So for a really long time, we mostly just studied fossils, right? Um, and then we looked at where those fossils existed, were the same or different, um, whether they diversified, things like that. Um, and today, if you want to study fossils, or sorry, if you want to study evolution today, um, we don't just have to look at bones. We don't just have to look at the past. We can actually have active, let's say, manipulation to, to study evolution. Um, and one of those ways is we use microorganisms. We use bacteria. They reproduce really quickly. They have relatively simple genes to understand from, but also they, um, what am I trying to say here? They can have enough generations quickly enough that you and I don't have to wait a million years to understand how, if we implement one change or another, um, how that might happen. This is also, I'm just gonna give a shout out to the scientific community at large, or in this case, specifically to the Center of Ecosystem Science and Society for a North, what is that? Uh, Northern Arizona University. There's this really fun idea that I imagine someone out there must have made this picture. I, I went looking for it and there's this gratifying thing where the science community has actually made the thing you're looking for. So someone with a good sense of humor here has shown you how they're working with bacteria. So they have lysobacteria and this idea that they can show predator prey responses or they can show how evolution is affected, um, right? It's this mirror thing of a gray wolf hunting a caribou as you would find different bacteria 
uh, hunting other bacteria. And so when they do these cultures and grow them together, they can mimic these theoretical things that we normally wouldn't ever be able to test. Um, and so we do that. We do that for understanding not just predator prey cycle in terms of abundance. I think that's how most people would think about a predator prey cycle being important. But a predator prey cycle can also drive, drive excuse me, the evolution of an animal. So their population size was then going to decide the genetic diversity, whether that balances out, right? This is that kind of changing to stay the same. These two species are in this race to survive against the other. And so they're having to evolve different traits, different behaviors in order to do so. And it's not just necessarily predator prey ones that they can study, they can study parasitic relationships as well. Um, which this one I just think is so great that they have looked at the uh, the vamp, uh, vampire bacteria base and use that as a concept for thinking about it. And believe it or not, uh, you're probably more familiar with this in your day-to-day -day life and certainly in the last few years than you might have ever thought of before. There's actually one way that we're all of us are mostly aware of rapid evolution and that is through antibiotic resistance. So it's this notion that you have a really quick evolution of a trait that can eventually become a whole shift, right? So one thing we tend to warn against in our healthcare system is, and it's the reason why we, you know, don't cure the common cold, even though we think we probably could, is that if you apply a bunch of uh, antibiotics to a bacteria, most of them will die off, but some of them will probably have the mutation to survive. And if you kill the, everything else off, then the only thing that's still going to survive after that is your resistant bacteria, where eventually the whole population will shift from not being able to survive to everything being able to survive. And then that antibiotic is obsolete, and you have to find another potentially more complicated um, or potentially you know, even a harmful way to actually break that through. So we see things like that happening all around. But I want to bring it back to um, to this guy, back to Darwin. Those birds there on the right side of the picture, those are Darwin's finches. In, I would say in the biology world, they're a very famous example of evolution. Uh, the thing to note on all of these, so they are, exist in the Galapagos. Uh, it is also one of, my, one of my dream trips to make it to the Galapagos and to, to go see these things that we only talk about in books. Um, so maybe one day I'll make it a one and a half scale up those trips. Fingers crossed. We'll see. But the thing to note on these finches is that their beak size is very different. And that's in result to them living on different islands and actually focusing on different food sources. Their size of seeds is essentially what they're trying to break into. And so the two thoughts to tie together are, I said that we have uh, antibodies, or excuse me, we have antibiotic resistance and bacteria is an example of rapid evolution. But we just got done saying that it takes millions of years for evolution to be a thing. So it's a bit contrary to have those two together. Is antibiotic rapid evolution, or do we need to have millions of years go by before we can actually believe that what we're seeing is evolution? And so I'm gonna bring us back to one of Darwin's original drawings, or I guess in some ways it's a bit of a recreation of it. So in The Origin of Species, Darwin comments, or it's his, he logics out that it takes 14,000 generations, after which time, in theory, there should be six new distinct species that came from those ancestors. That's kind of that big tree effect, right? The, further, the more generations you keep going, the more, more diversity you would have. And so 14,000 generations of humans is a long time, right? If you're going for on an 80-year average, you're looking at thousands and thousands of years. For bacteria, right, you actually are looking at about weeks to months, maybe years, depending on, you know, the turnover of things like that. And so we can see evolution happening in front of us. We can see it happening rapidly. Um, but just to, uh, how am I trying to go with this? I wanted to point that out because we, it's this idea that it happens in different ways. But the important thing that comes from this is that uh, we understand that evolution can happen on multiple time scales. It can happen on ones that we can understand. It can happen on ones that are greater than human time scale. Um, but the important thing from this is that we get a common language about it. Uh, 
We often generalize that we can all understand the same thing, but it's the exceptions, those nuances of how you actually understand it, right? So this is this is that break point between understanding evolution as Big Bang Theory and this billions and billions of years for change to happen versus changes happening all around us all the time, different organisms at different rates. So complicated, but worth it. Now, I guess the take home from this though is that in order for us to talk about bears, which I promise we're going to talk about bears, we need to have a we need to have a definition about it. So there's a few different definitions, which is classic, of what rapid evolution is. The one that we're going to work with from this point on in in our webinar is that um, in we'll say more complicated organisms, having changes happen in around or less than a hundred thousand years. That's an example of rapid evolution, right? Because people say, oh well, it's bacteria; it's so simple, no wonder it can evolve really quickly, right? So you know, animals like humans, we've got, we'll put bears on that same level of complexity. So in that hundred-ish thousand year scale, that's, if things can make dramatic changes, then we're going to call that rapid evolution. All right, time to talk about bears. Now that we kind of set the stage, hopefully appropriately. So I'll, I'm going to give you the punchline is that polar bears evolve from brown bears, if you did not already know that. They are their closest cousin. We do have eight extant species of bear in the world today. Uh, that extant se section ugh, word is important because it's the notion that there are eight species of bears today, but in the past there were many more. These are simply the ones that are still alive uh, and still propagating, and arguably you could say even say still diversifying. So in different places where these populations are migrating or are getting isolated, some of those, right, some of those causes of evolution that we talked about before, um, there's arguing about subspecies that are forming. And again, these are arguments or better words to say is conversations that are ha being had as to whether or not they're new species that we're seeing. But um, it's, a, it's, a, it's always in flux. Now we'll say the bears that we, as we know them today, as the polar bear and as the brown bear, it looks like they split off from one another around 500,000 years ago. And this is why I've spent most of my polar bear crew saying, oh, it's rapid evolution because other bear species, they split up around 5 million years ago. Pandas actually split off crazily around 20 million years ago. They're, they're kind of like the oldest cousin of the branch. They're the most different that way. And so, uh, when we look at their some of their splitting up from the perspective of just of evolutionary history, we could really just think about a polar bear as a very specialized brown bear. And this is again, it gets messy of what is a species, what is not. We consider them separate species, but I just want you to kind of think about that for a second. They're that's their closest cousin. Um, they didn't necessarily. They would have had a common ancestor at some point, but then that common ancestor started developing in different ways. Um, but they're still close enough genetically that they can breed back with one another. It happens sometimes in captivity. It has uh, now been recorded a handful of times out in the wild. Um, requires certain conditions, and by that I mean it's pretty much, they have to meet during mating season, because any other time of the year, they usually just end up in a fight. But, and those, offspring are viable. They are able to have cubs of their own and continue onwards. There's even actually a couple generations of hybrids, I think up in Alaska, there's one female bear who likes to keep breeding back with, or there's a female polar bear who likes to keep breeding back with male grizzlies, and so does her daughters, which I think is kind of funny. Preferences get passed down. So that's their closest cousin of evolution. Um, and if they're a special, I'm just gonna say this, if they're a specialized brown bear, what is special about them? All right, we're going to go back to the remote control, right? So we're going to say that they're different enough that they have different genes now and they can turn different switches on and press different buttons to create different traits, things that you and I now can see, right? We can't see their genes, but we can see what they look like. We can see how they behave. We can see what they eat, right? That's us being able to see the outcome of that. So the most obvious one, right, if you were to ask a small child what's the difference between a polar bear and a brown bear, or well, it's the color, right? So it's the lack of pigmentation that has evolved in the polar bear. Also a big misnomer, right? There are lots of colors of brown bears. There are ones that are even so blonde that you might think they're white. So the ability, right, so you could almost say 
there were lots of color switches in the brown bear's genetics, but now in the polar bear genetics, there's only one color switch, right? There's only one gene dial to make that happen now. So that's one way to think about it. Uh, some other ones, right? Polar bears have smaller ears, right? Keeping things in cold. They have larger paws. Front ones are more paddle-like for some of that swimming effect. Their claws are shorter, um, less for digging, more for hooking and traction on the ice. Um, some small, some smaller ones. The polar bears have uh, four sets of teeth, while brown bears have six. That has to do with the general cub ratio. Polar bears tend to usually have twins. Brown bears are more often to have triplets. Right? That's things that you could argue are still. It's getting on the edge of you know are those switches still there? But we haven't seen polar bears re-evolve that other set of teeth yet. So we can argue that that switch, that gene, is gone at least functionally. Other big one is their diet. So polar bears are no longer omnivorous. They are chomping down on all the seal meat and all the meat they can find, whereas brown bears are looking for all sorts of different things. Um, and some of them are specialists, right? There are some like up in Katmai that are salmon hunting like nobody's business. But in general, you go to different polar, excuse me, you go to different brown bear populations, they're eating all sorts of different things. You go to different polar bear populations, they're all still mostly eating seals and the odd whale if they can get it, things like that, right? So that's kind of how we understand them now. These are the traits that we look at, and this is what we say makes them distinct from one another or distinct enough, even though they can still breed back with each other. Well, physically it's possible, but it doesn't happen very often. So how, how do we start learning about the switchboard and how that was different now compared to today? How do we start looking at their genes uh, and understanding that? As I said before, if we wanted to understand evolution, we mostly just looked at the bones. But the last, I mean, I would say that being alive in the last 25-ish, maybe 30 years of, of studying biology has been some of the most fascinating because there's been some of these massive, massive jumps in our science, mostly through understanding DNA, um, working on these micro scales, right? Understanding the world in a much, much different way than we have in a long time. So these are two uh, things I want to point out, or sorry, these are two bones that are very, very historic in the polar bear world. The one, so top on the left there is a jawbone from Svalbard. It's dated to be around 130,000 years old, maybe plus or minus 10, 20,000 years on either side of that. The oldest fossil that we have of a polar bear. And so it's kind of a big deal, just saying. Uh, <laughs> um, so I think they found it in 2004. Don't quote me on that date, I'm not 100% sure on that one. But it didn't get sequenced, so they sequenced, they are actually able to pull the DNA out of that, which is pretty crazy. They pulled out the mitochondrial DNA um, around the 2010s. And that was the first time they were actually able to get a look at what was going on and when some of these gene flows between polar bears and, and brown bears were happening. Now. The other skull, sorry, the, uh, these are also, these are not connected. These are two different finds from, one is from Svalbard, the other one, the, the top part of the skull there. Uh, that is a bear that was nicknamed Bruno, even though once they did the genetics, they found out it was a she, so her name is Bruno. And that was, one was found in 2009. And it's the, um, I, to, to my knowledge, it is still to date the only ancient polar bear skull that we found in North America. So there are other ones you can find across the world, but in North America, this is the only one we found. Um, someone literally found it walking across the beach, which you might say, you know, why is there so few? But this is a big difference between other bears is that polar bears are marine mammals, which means that most of the time when they die, they die out on the sea ice. That sea ice is not static. It will melt, it will be broken up, and then those bones sink to the bottom of the ocean. Many of us never ever to be found. And so, Polar bears, again, if we go back to thinking about evolution like this murder mystery puzzle, are an extremely hard puzzle to solve because we have so few pieces of the puzzle to put together. Uh, but that's an aside. So, this, so the analysis from Bruno, one of the coolest things that came from her genetics, was that they found out that brown bears today all have sorry, say this, polar bear genes reintroduced back into them. 
And so what that means is that they separate at one point and then the surviving population or the surviving North American brown bears, where whatever their common ancestor was, rebred with polar bears after they had split up and then gone back together. So uh, it changed the story a lot. We used to think that, oh, the reason why they were so common was because the brown bears are the older cousins, which is true, but it just means that they actually, there's been multiple crossovers back and forth. Evolution is not clean and tidy. It's a very, very messy business. Okay, so let's start thinking about their, their genetics and their genes and what that can tell us. So when we think about, when we, when we use all these words, we'll kind of break down what we're talking about here because I definitely had to review some of these things in my brain. We, you know, we usually talk about humans have 23 chromosomes and we are genes and then we have base pairs and we say all these words. So what does that mean? So the chromosome, and so the reason why we say X chromosome or Y chromosome is our genes, it's the big tangled up pile of them. And if you were to pull on that thread and stretch it out, that long double helix, double helix is our genes. Sections of that is our genes. And so polar bears, so humans for us, we've got around 3 million base pairs. So the base pairs, if you look at the colorful one, that um, green, red, yellow, each one of those is a base pair. So for us humans, we've got about 3 million of those polar bears. They got about three and a half million. Uh, a distinction is how we package them though. So you and I, that kind of big bundle of them, the chromosome, we package ours into 23 chromosomes. Polar bears package theirs into 37. And so those packages, when we pull them apart, that's where we start looking at the genes. So we're going to talk about their genes now. So polar bears, if we look at a big difference between um, polar bear genes versus brown bear genes, there's been lots of studies over the last 10, 15 years of taking out um, a subpopulation of bears. So, you know, they'll take the genes of, they'll fully sequence nine or 10 polar bear, um, nine or 10 polar bears and then maybe nine or 10 brown bears, and they start comparing them to different populations. And one of the things we learned from them is that there are about 16, so 60, we'll just call them sections, right? That's the gene, that's the double helix. There's 16 genes that are really, really quite different between polar bears and brown bears. This is one of the things that they, when they changed over, um, and one of, about nine of them are associated with the vascular system. And so, the cardiovascular system, right, that's how your blood gets through the body, um, your arteries, things like that. So polar bears have made a big jump away from brown bears in order to be able to live in the Arctic, right? Their circulation needed to change. As a cool aside, the, so the cartoon version, you and I being able to see it as a double helix, you know, there's, uh, there are special microscopes to some extent, but really the way that most scientists are studying this is that really beautiful color of, looks like a stained glass window. So that's uh, genomic splicing. So they break up the genes and they actually can follow the patterns of certain sizes. So when they're actually interpreting the data, they're not looking at it usually in that fun double helix, they're looking at it in all of these colored slates. Um, so again, I just think it's fun to connect the science we understand to how we understand it. Also, it's fun when it's beautiful and colorful. It's never a bad thing. So one of those genes, uh, right? So one of those folks is are out of those um, nine that are really important or sorry, out of the 16, nine of them are focused on circulation and a couple of them that are really unique. And this is really important. It's the reason why polar bears are able to survive is that it's focused on fats, right? So I said they're eating seals. They're mostly eating their blubber. Uh, when they're blubber, they're eating. So a polar bear, depending on chowing down in a meal, it can chow down 50, 100 plus pounds of blubber in a meal. Each one of those pounds is packed with maybe 800 or excuse me, 8,000 to 12,000 calories. You and I, our heart would stop. There is no way we could chow down on that much food, even if we just sat there and ate McDonald's burgers steadily or whichever, right? That amount of cholesterol would kill us. Um, so polar bears, one of the really important differences that they've evolved away from, right? The ones that survived when the brown bears cousins were evolving into polar bears, the ones that could deal with a high fat diet are the ones that their genetics got passed on. The ones that couldn't, those are the ones that didn't survive. So that's kind of talking about some of the genes that are important. So now maybe trickling in the back of your mind is, well, how could the genes have changed? So one of those, we call them missense mutation. And this one is just kind of think about being a, being a dictator, right? Someone's, someone's telling you words and you're writing it out and you, mis, you mistype a letter. Right, so I said we have base pairs, we call them C, A, and T, 
it doesn't really matter too much. But all you need to know is that you're just writing a bunch of comp your your body is writing out these pairs and it accidentally puts a C where they're supposed to be an A. And lo and behold, we call that a mutation. Sometimes that mutation is benign, doesn't do anything. Sometimes it's bad for us and it doesn't help us, right? That's what we talk about. Um, you know, some things are related to our genetics, right? If we if we uh, inherit a weak heart or something like that, you know, because we got a mix up in our typewriters. But sometimes it can help us. And so there there was a, a study that identified about a thousand of these misprints that don't exist in brown bears that exist in polar bears. Um, and they're consistent. That's why they're called fixed mysense mutations. So that means that they were a mutation that evolved, were, was helpful, and now has stuck around and become part of the regular chain. So that's on, on an individual level. That's where how genes can change. There's also something else that's called copy number variation, which is really just a fancy way of saying, how many times did you press the print button? Did you print it three times, two times, one time, right? So the gene can be the same piece of information. It's the same code, the same sequence of letters. Um, but when our bodies are reprinting it, when we're making our copies of our DNA, when we're inheriting that from our mom and our dad, we can actually make more or less copies of it. And so, one cool example of that, and we have this as well. So there is a gene, uh, it makes a protein called amylase, and amylase is what our body uses to break down starch. So things like potatoes and chickpeas and breads and quinoa and oatmeal, all of those things, right? If we have more of those, so if I go back to this slide for just a second, the more copies we have of amylase, the more our body can break down the starch and we can have that energy accessible to our body. If we happen to have fewer copies, then actually we don't get to break it down and our body doesn't get to use that energy. And this is found in different ancient um, This was found in populations of humans. You can see that different ancient cultures where they had starchier diets um, did evolve to have higher amount of, amounts of amylase than those that didn't. So we see that in uh, we see that in our cells, and we see it in polar bears too. So I was saying that polar bears are hyper carnivores versus brown bears, black, uh, yeah, brown bears and black bears, they're omnivores. So there's, so our brown bears and our black bears, they are still chowing down on starches. They're still eating roots. They're still trying to eat berries. And so they have a lot of these amylase copies. Polar bears actually have very few. They do not digest starch very well. They're geared towards mostly digesting fat. And then probably second best is what they can digest is protein. Um, and so another sort of connection I want to make, or, or I get that, maybe I want to back this up. The reason why I paused on this slide is because I want to point out that science doesn't have to be scary. Even for me, I haven't done genetics in, I want to say 12, 15 years, which is a terrifying notion in and of itself just to say that. Um, but when I looked at this first and I was reading these papers so I could come and share all this cool stuff with you folks, I was like, what in the world does this mean? I don't know how to, I don't know how to read this. I don't understand this. Um, and I think that there's this barrier between science and the public, which is really unfortunate. Um, one, for anyone who's out there who's going to work in science, it's a big part, actually in any job, but I'm going to lay this on at the feet of scientists. It's important that we be good at communicating our results. And that comes down from having a conversation with your neighbor to how you set up a graph and show people. Um, but I also just want to show you that actually you've already learned enough from the last 40 minutes you've spent with me to interpret this. So this is what I mean. I told you before that we don't see the genes in those helical structures, right? We see them in that big, beautiful, dotty glass window, right? It had all the colors last time. Well, in this graph, it doesn't have all the colors, but if you look and see where it's light or dark, see they've got the three bears they've got the black bear then they've got the brown bear genetics then they've got the polar bear one you can see whether they're light or dark and then you can compare just look in vertical lines that's all you need to do and each one of those kind of tetris box lines if it's lit up or if it's dark it means it does or doesn't have that so remember i said amylase uh the one that breaks down starch that's what i put in the yellow box here that's that a m y one b that's the number to get for you follow that gray line back up you can see that polar bears don't have much of it anymore, whereas brown bears still have it, and black bears, at least for the two that they had in that sample, there wasn't a lot, right? Um, so just wanted to show you 
that even just a little bit, you're already able to kind of read some of this stuff. Um, and so don't be, don't be afraid of science. Don't be afraid of graphs. There's lots of great things that can come from it. Okay. Oh, yes, but this is what I wanted to point out from this. Sorry, I got a little bit ahead of myself. So, what, so I pointed out the amylase one. There's another gene in here, and this one actually was so cool for me to learn, which is that polar bears have um, lost their number of copies for smelling, for olfactory senses, which to me, I was like, wait a second. I know from all the work I've done with polar bears that they have an amazing sense of smell. And by that, I mean they can smell things from kilometers, miles and miles away, right? They can pick up a scent um, where, and this is the part that I hadn't really thought of before until I was reading some of these papers, which is that, so yes, polar bears still have an amazing sense of smell, right? Their ability to pick up molecules is really good, but their diversity is actually quite low. Which I've never thought of before necessarily. So a brown bear, right? When you think about the world they're interacting with, it's very diverse. Maybe they're eating carcasses. Maybe they're climbing up a tree and snagging some honey. Maybe they're digging up roots. So they're trying to interface with all of these different smells. Whereas polar bears live in a ice dominated environment with mostly marine, with marine prey, very little other interactions really. And so while they have a very strong sense of smell, they actually have a quite low diversity of smell as compared to their cousins. So that's one of the things that they, they lost along the way. And so we can see that, that the route that we get to these genes and which ones we keep and which ones we lose, it's about efficiency, right? Um, it takes energy to pass along genetic information. If that information isn't helpful, then it doesn't get to stay. And that's both in maybe the organism doesn't survive or just to the number of uh, copies that get passed along to you. So one thing that's true as much as today as it has been pretty much since polar bears have ever existed is that they have always been a relatively small population. So what I mean by that is that today in the world there's around 25, it's estimated around 25,000 polar bears. I'd say plus or minus five or six thousand on either side of that. And this here is just showing you WWF has has shown you the, the subpopulations of those. Whereas there are hundreds of thousands of brown bears and black bears in North America alone. And so they have always actually had a smaller amount, smaller population, which means a limited genetic diversity, um, but they've been able to, to match the niche that they have. So they've evolved quickly, and even still today are relatively small population out of that rapid evolution. One thing we talk about with rapid evolution is that they're also very vulnerable to um, changes, right? So they've evolved to fit this niche environment because the world cooled down. And if we all of a sudden got a snowball earth, I bet we would have an explosion of diversity in polar bears, but we're not, we're warming up. And so instead that is being decreased. Now this has happened before in the past too. And one thing I, I often get as a question is, well, what are polar bears going to evolve into? And the answer to that, or the smart one is, I don't know. Uh, we could say that polar bears might survive as they are today. We could say that uh, maybe this is an idea, which I don't think is likely to happen, but people say, oh, well, they're gonna, maybe they can hybrid with brown bears and get reintroduced back. My argument to that is that that's no longer a polar bear then, is it? It's something new. We've moved into something new. So it's hard to say. Um, but there's a few take homes with the last few minutes I have here that I wanted to share with everyone. Uh, the first one, as a thought to end on, is that we are all not so different from anything else on this planet. Uh, I know that this imagery tends to make some people uncomfortable, depending on uh, maybe whether or not you've seen it before, or but this is just embryonic development, and it's just showing whether you're a fish or an amphibian or bird or human, is that we all look pretty darn the same, actually, from the get-go. Um, and so I just think it's really important, and I think it's really actually quite humbling to, you know, for as amazing as us humans think we are, we really are fundamentally so the same um, as a lot of our brother and sister organisms all around the world. And one of my favorite drive homes of this, even if you want to go a step farther, even back from, uh, you know, comparing us to other mammals or birds or reptiles, is, um, so don't stress about this too much. It's a big chunk of chemistry, but I want you to know that these two things are the exact same molecules. The only difference is that Plant chlorophyll has magnesium at the center, and human blood has iron at the center. Otherwise, it's the same molecule, right? And so, like, 
we're just all of our world is so incredibly similar and it's just these small changes that make these other things that are amazingly possible uh second thing maybe as a bit of a take home is a quote if i go roll us back to darwin and his lovely hat um, this is a quote from the origin of species it is difficult to tell and immaterial for us whether habits generally change first and structure afterwards or whether slight modifications of structure lead to changed habits both probably often change simultaneously um, which i just i actually really like right is it your behavior that changes who you are is it what you are changes who you are and that works on an individual day-to-day -day level all the way up to evolution um, and i guess my hope is that it's just being accountable for for the change that our habits do evoke right um, everything we do causes change from the the conversation i'm having now or this webinar we're sharing with you all the way up to whatever you have for breakfast today it all involves change uh, and I suppose the last thing I wanted to address here with the, the window of time I have is that there are things that evolution can and cannot do. I was lucky enough actually to stumble across one of my old professor's uh, lectures when I was whipping this together, a fellow by the name of Andrew Hendry, if you ever want to look him up. And, uh, you know, we, we have a very human-centric lens. We think about you know, we think about things in terms of good and bad from a human perspective. Uh, and also everyone's perspective is different. You know, if you think biodiversity is good, uh, then evolution is good. Um, but then there's this notion of, well, it'll maybe it will save us. There's this term out there that's called evolutionary rescue. This idea that, you know, these organisms will be able to adapt and they'll be able to change and they'll save the species, uh, which is a which is kind of a dangerous thing to think about. It's not that it's not true. A lot of organisms will have the ability to adapt and survive in a changing world, um, but some of them don't. Some of them don't. So I think things to really think about is that yes, evolution will keep a lot of species in our world as our world changes, and they'll change alongside with it. But it won't keep all of them. Some species won't make it. Some populations won't make it. That's just uh, that's just the truth. And that actually, yes, evolution will preserve some of the ecosystem services, some of the things we're used to having in nature, but it might not preserve them in the way that you and I know them as they are. What does that mean? It might mean that it's a different species that fills that role, right? I said the cod may or may not ever come back. Well, it might be a different fish species that then claims that role in the ecosystem and keeps the ecosystem thriving and surviving. Um, and so, it's this big complex puzzle that we don't have all the pieces to. And so, uh, you know, we, we, we made evolution this very abstract notion, but I hope with today's conversation that, uh, that we've brought it back to, to who and what we are as people. And with that, I will pass it to you, Sunny, for any questions folks might have. Thank you so much, Christina. And we do have a lot of questions, so I'll jump right into those. Um, polar bears depend on seals for their sustenance. Is the seal population stable or decreasing? Do you mm. know anything about the seal population? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, their primary seal is ring seals. They do eat other seals, but in general, there's about 2 million ring seals in the Arctic. And I would say that in the same way that polar bear habitat is threatened by changing sea ice, so is the ring seal. What I mean by that is that in some places in the Arctic, it's getting a bit better. So there's more food availability and some places it's getting worse. And how that's possible could be a whole webinar in itself, but I'll just give a quick short answer, which is that um, seals live over a spot where they can dive to a depth to get food. If the sea ice recedes to a place where it's so deep, then it's basically actually a desert and no one can dive there. And if the seals can't eat, the bears can't eat. And then in some places, uh, the ice is thinning out, and so seals can actually access more food where they couldn't before. That's the, the shortest answer I can give you. And so we haven't seen dramatic changes in seal populations yet, but we are, as a whole, I'm going to say it that way, but we are seeing loss of, um, we're seeing population declines in some area and increases in others. And so you can essentially, you can track kind of polar bear, you can predict the prey, you can predict the predator by looking at the prey. Um, so it's nothing, yeah, in the areas that we have enough data for, we can see small changes. There's also huge tracts of the Arctic that we don't have data for. So just keep that in mind too, but yes. Hmm. Interesting. 
Um, are the polar bears genetics different in Svalbard versus North America? Yeah, so um, we call it clades in genetics and it's this idea a clade is who you can track back to a common ancestor. So there are three genetic clades that exist um, in our current polar bear population. Uh, I should I wish I had a map for this. In general, so most of, let's say, Russia and Scandinavia is one genetic clade. Then let's say Alaska and the top of the Canadian archipelago, so most of our islands up there, is a second genetic clade. And then there's a third smaller one that's kind of the North Atlantic. So let's say for anyone's Canadian geography into Quebec um, and then over into Hudson Bay. So that's the three, like very generally, those are the three, and, and they do have crossover just for the record, but those are the three common ancestor groups we would trace them back to. Okay. How influential is diet in evolution? The grizzly yeah. bear, the grizzly bear would need to know how to hunt and survive as a polar bear long enough to breed. Does the prey's DNA help evolve the species quicker? Good, Ooh, good questions. Okay. I don't know if I feel like these are two cool questions, questions in one. one. But I thought that was a cool question. <laughs> no, it's such a good question. Bravo. Um, okay, so let's do let's break I, I see that as th um, three questions so the first question is how does diet affect evolution um it absolutely does uh, i would actually say that diet is probably the primary driver that's that's created the different genes between what a polar bear is now compared to what a black bear is um the reason being on a very basic function right survival comes down to do you have enough energy and so any mutation that increases your energy consumption is going to give you an advantage. Most of the polar bear genes that we see that are different from brown bears are related to uh, breaking down fats, so having a high fat diet. Um, they've lost their ability to eat starches. They, uh, their, their whole body is geared towards that. They also, yeah, they have the ability to like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They don't feel full. There's a bunch of other things like their genetics are, are, are driven towards that. So huge driver. Second one, um, brown bears diet hunting as a polar bear. So this is one we see, it's, an, it's kind of an assumption, but it also we've seen it in the few examples of the hybrids that we know, which is that, um, so do, whether or not the hybrid survives has a lot to do with whether or not your mom is the polar bear or your mom is the grizzly bear. Um, and so they'll, if they can't, like the polar bear surviving as the generalist, depends on what their diet is, right? If it's a, if it's a brown bear that's already as a hunter, then they don't have to worry about as much crossover. If it's a foraging brown bear, Again, you might not have the same traits because if you think about it, you're gonna learn to forage from your mom. They're the one that's gonna teach you how to hunt or what to find. Um, and so we tend to see the, which ones survive more? I gotta think about this for a second. It's the, uh, yeah. The, uh, I think we see more survivors if your mom is the polar bear, like they're able to survive the other direction because there's there's still enough flex that they could they could make it to both diets. But yeah, it, it gets a bit tricky. And then the third, what was the third part of the prey's DNA help evolve the species quicker? That is such a good question, um, which I'm going to say I don't know. I can tell you what I think. Um, but so in general, the answer would be no. Um, but you could you could make an argument against that because the fitness of the prey would then decide the evolutionary benefits of the uh, predator. So an example of that is that if you have uh, if you have a seal that is really you know is better at putting on weight because of its genetics. Even think about people, right? Some of us, our metabolisms are so fast we can't put on weight to save our lives. Some of us, we put on weight like nobody's business, right? So if that's your prey source, then you're going to selectively, you know, the they're going to hunt the slower ones or they're going to hunt that so that you then you're going to that's when I was showing before about the microbes and the predator prey cycle it 100% they drive each other um, and so like consuming the individual genetics doesn't make a difference but what genetics are surviving in a population 100% do there we go that's my final answer for that interesting interesting well that is the last question we have time for today so I will
hand it back to you for closing comments. Thank you, Sunny. Thank you everyone for the engagement today. This was a really fun one to do. Um, I always, I, one thing I love is that I never get tired of learning and I never, and I always realize there's so much more I don't know. So I hope lots of folks feel that way out there too, uh, with just a growing curiosity for their world. And yeah, please take care. I'll be back again in about a month. And who knows, I actually, if you wanna leave any suggestions for topics, please let me know, cause I haven't decided what I'm gonna do next. So we'll see where we go from here. Excellent. Thank you again, Christina. We always enjoy your talks. We learn so much. And I want to thank everybody who submitted questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all your questions, but again, I just so appreciate um, the, the level of thoughtfulness and curiosity that our viewers bring to the, the question section. It's, I, I always learn so much. Um, and thank you for tuning in. Please tune in again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, we'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.